coffee in Ethiopia in relation to development. And so I'll be giving a presentation today on the role of coffee in open defecation policy um, in Addis Ababa. Um, please bear with me, this is a complete work in progress. Um, and as you'll soon find out, it's this development project is bringing very several disparate things together and trying to craft um, a model for um, uh, changing habits in uh, defecation habits in the city. And so, you know, this presentation will also be a little messy. Um, I will first introduce um, Addis and where I was working um, and the project, both how it's the narrative that is given when I'm talking to kind of uh, the government elite, and then also how we experience it more on the ground. Um, eventually, I'll end up with the experiences of the cooperative members who manage the toilets and um, perform the coffee ceremonies. And then I'll open it up to discussion, um, especially in relation to the paper. So, Addis, um, well, Ethiopia is a country in the Horn of Africa. Um, it's There are now 102 million people in the country. Um, Within the city proper, it's 3.6 million, 4.6 million in the metro population. Um, and defecation, open defecation has been a problem um, across Africa and Asia. And the World Bank has um, invested a lot of money of, um, on a global scale to kind of, to changing defecation habits. Um, Ethiopia, for Ethiopia, it has been the hardest Millennium Development Goal to achieve. Um, that development goal is number seven, which is ensure environmental sustainability. Um, specifically, target 7C, so having by 2015 the proportion of the population without sustainable access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation. Mm -hmm. And so the project here is trying to combat open defecation giving resources to communities that do not have access to clean water, and also educating people on hygiene and sanitation. Um, in March of this year, the World Bank published a new strategy handbook for combating open defecation. Previously, um, the, focus, the focus was on um, seeing defecation practices as conscious, rational choices. But in this new model, um, they're shifting that focus to seeing defecation as a habit. And so their approach is now to, um, that habits are frequent learned behavioral responses that are cued automatically by context cues, such as physical settings, um, and preceding actions in a sequence. And so this new project is meant to nudge people in a different direction, to adopt different practices. Um, and they list out eight different strategies of doing this. And I'm going to be focusing on principle number six, which is adding ritualized elements to the intervention can actually enhance eff effectiveness in advocacy. Um, by the way, this is what the public toilets look like in Ethiopia. Um, another one of the strategies is having a slogan. Um, in Ethiopia, you can see sanitation for all everywhere. Um, this is the toilet. This is the coffee ceremony. And please, like I did in the field, um, play I spy the coffee and I spy the toilet throughout this presentation. <laughs> Are these paid toilets? They are paid toilets. I'll be introducing um, but before I do that, this is the official narrative that I was given. This is a short vignette. Um, so, you know, right now, six out of ten people are drinking coffee or something like that. Um, after six weeks of chasing whispers floating through the halls of Addis Ababa's water and sewage agency corridors, I'm finally nested between Ada Jamal Rashid's mahogany desk and a table for 12. The general manager of the sewage disposal, disposal treatment, reuse, and care process sits in the, his leather chair. 
His eyes follow the unsteady hands of his second secretary as she rattles the kettle of Una on a silver tray. I draw a soggy notebook from my tattered purse. As I fold my legs, I notice that the mud trailing from the jelly soles of my Doc Martens to the inside of my knee. My eyes start to auto Jamal, his ivory turtleneck sweater and slurping of Una warm the room. For more than a hundred years, only 66 public toilets existed within Addis Ababa. They were not much active. People were uninterested. They did not use them to urinate or sit. He pauses for another slurp. Atta, please drink. My left hand scratches Kaka from my calf while my right hand scratches his fragmented circular thoughts. I put the pen down and reach for the Buna. It doesn't have any life. Coffee is life. But Buna, Buna is not the purpose of this project. The purpose, the purpose is for the toilet. Um, and when Marit and I were walking down the street though, the first thing, this was, say within two hours of landing in Addis is we stumbled upon coffee on the street. Coffee is traditionally a domestic um, ritual performed by women but in the past five years they brought it out to the public sphere and we just saw a woman like this um, making coffee so we sat down and in a conversation an informal conversation um, with a man who sat down and asked why we were sitting there um, he said, you know, these are public parks, um, they're trying to green the city, and they serve coffee, but they even have toilets. And so when you're interacting with it in terms of the public space, the first thing that you see is not the toilet. The first thing that you see is the coffee. And in this, um, the way that I'm approaching this project is really seeing this ritualized element as central to this development model and central to defecation policy. Um, in Addis. So as I just said, the uh, coffee is very important to Ethiopia. Um, here's a quote from a uh, rural um, Ethiopian woman. Uh, she was talking about um, if you serve coffee, if you serve food without coffee, it is like you have served nothing. <laughs> in every meeting that we had, immediately it would be, would you like a cup? After five meetings in a day, five to seven cups of coffee, by the sixth, seventh meeting, you know, people were up, I don't know, not necessarily upset, but they wanted to make sure that they would have the opportunity in the future to take you out for coffee. Um, traditionally, the coffee ceremony um, entails uh, three different pours, boiling the coffee three different times, and drinking each. Um, and when you sit down at these public spaces, they do include a lot of these elements that are um, uh, that are central to the traditional coffee ceremony. So you have grass in underneath the uh, rekabat or the table um, to symbolize fertility. You have um, what's the other thing? You have tana adam, which is over here, and you have the incense burning too. Um, here's the background more for the toilet project. Um, as you can see, this is a map of all of the toilets, the public mobile, sorry, mobile public toilets in Addis thus far. Right now, there are 107, and they each have a name based on their location. Each has three different stalls per male and female, two of them squatters, one of them western, for disabled. Um, each of them are managed by a cooperative of 10 people. Originally, this was a development project aimed at employing the disabled. But once they realized that the disabled didn't work hard enough, they um, aimed at empowering women, so 70% of those employed are women, 30% are men, and you have to be unemployed over the age of 18, and they're also targeting HIV, AIDS patients, cancer patients. Um, you do have to pay for the toilet. It's one burr. In order to buy shy or tea, it's three burr. Uh, coffee is four burr. 20% of the funds from the toilets only 
goes back to the Addis Ababa Water and Sewerage Agency that's managing the project. If you talk to the people managing the project, if you talk to the people on the ground, they and all of the people on the ground say that the cooperatives are actually paying 50% back to the agency. Um, the, the governing structure is very decentralized where the district is the one that is supposed to be evaluating the sites, managing conflict, working with people to, um, uh, for education purposes, working on infrastructure. And so I'm not quite sure where that 30% is going, but it could very well be going to the district, even though they're not supposed to be receiving any. Um, and as I said before, this project does provide conflict management um, and continued education for the cooperative members. So the methods that I used were pretty much participant observation and informal conversations with both cooperative members um, and customers and just citizens throughout Ethiopia. This was a very approachable project. When I was traveling throughout Ethiopia, I was able to talk to them about how they would view this if this was implemented in their community. Um, or just the fact that ODF or open defecation free um, has be kind has become kind of a salient thing, even in rural communities where they're building public toilets or one public toilet facility um, and aiming to have all of the communities use them. Also, I um, had more formal extended interviews with government officials. That would be at the Addis Ababa Water and Sewerage Agency, um, small and micro enterprise associations because it is a cooperative um, at both the federal and the city level. Um, and also with cooperative members, I had quite a few extensive um, interviews trying to tease out sometimes the contradictory information that I was getting and kind of peel back the layers to these, to these women's stories that are very, very complex. Um, the theory, one of the theories that I would like to apply or try to think about the project is a model for development, and this builds off of um, what Mari um, presented earlier this year. And also, I see some themes in terms of technology of governance that um, Megan presented last week. So, building off of Geertz, which uses the Model 4, um, which is a prescriptive model um, in which the development project shows the way things ought to be, I've kind of adopted the event that models from Handelman. And that's about a model that has a clear goal, a method of reaching that goal, and an overall control of the means of reaching that goal. Um, the reason why I like this is because Handelman uses event or public event as ritual. And so he's bridging model with ritual, and I think that that's very important for this project. Um, technology of governance is actants. As I said before, I see coffee as being almost an actant in these spaces, uh, reshaping social order, reshaping social ties, um, and it kind of adopts a social life as its own. Um, and so I would, yeah, playing with that kind of idea. So here are just the three main um, ideas that the project is trying to adopt in order to change people's habits. <coughs> the first thing, it really just builds off of how integral coffee is to Ethiopia. Coffee is the drink of Ethiopia. Everyone wants to drink. Everyone wants to sit and have coffee. Um, because of this, they are stationed at transit, transit stations where you have a lot of traffic, you have a lot of movement. And the idea is that they should be rest areas. They should be green. They should have um, invite people in with coffee, with flower boxes, with um, in order to and, and trees, right? And it should be because coffee is a tool for chatting and a tool to share ideas and a stimulant. It will invite people in and make people stay and use the toilets. Um, when I spoke to government officials, they said that coffee has good hygiene. It's integral to the hygiene system. That's why coffee is there. 
Um, I have yet to tease out what they really meant by that. Um, it's a little confusing to me, but when I spoke to people on the ground, they talked about, again, coffee as a ritual. And when we drink coffee, we drink our surroundings. If we smell the coffee and smell the toilets, we are drinking both. So by putting coffee there, it's kind of trying to, I think it's, try it's, it's trying to let you drink both. <laughs> other quotes about how coffee um, or no I'm sorry in the so when I was doing my research in Addis it is cramped it is cold and it's wet but when it's hot the smell of the toilets would be very unwelcoming and so there is a plan that, and that's why the women love the incense is because it's more inviting and masks the smells um, so in a way, at least the government narrative is trying to use coffee as legitimizing it as a, uh, a foul space to be more clean. Um, here's one of the toilets and the coffee. So again, the toilets are over here, and this is the coffee ceremony. Um, and I spent a lot of time working with these women. Um, the project seeks to map sanitation areas onto dirty landscapes. So this is a waste sorting, um, waste sorting site for three cabelas, which are in three neighborhoods. Um, now, when they first implemented this toilet, it was because there was a woman in the community who contracted cholera, her and her son, and because the district office is the one that chooses the sites, they decided they had to put one here <coughs> to make sure that people were aware of sanitation, had access to clean water, and would, able to, would be able to kind of uh, shift people's um, habits of openly defecating there and just seeing it as more of a clean site. The first day that they opened this trash heap, was right in front of the the um, the entrance to the coffee toilet, and so there has been a little bit of tension in terms of um, who kind of has more autonomy over that space. Um, Can you probably have to? I didn't really think the time, but I know. probably on fifteen minutes. Because I've been kind of looking. Okay, but so yeah. just go ahead. I'll. It's not minutes. much longer. They're also, the women who manage the sites also are responsible for educating. All over the sites they have posters of um, <coughs> cleaning, um, how to wash your hands, etc. There was a story about um, how because they're next to transit stations, you have a lot of um, taxi drivers around and they make a decent salary but they do not want to pay for the burn to use the toilets. But they'll come and drink the coffee. Um, and so they were peeing on the side of the church, which was across the street. And the women were yelling, come, 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 please use our facilities. You know, we, we can talk about, you know, cleaning this area for our neighborhood, please don't do this. Um, and they said, no, I'm gonna finish, but I'll come and have some coffee. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, and finally, it's about women serving the community, and this is what uh, this, along with uh, this kind of environmental stewardship narrative about green and clean, really ties with the paper that I'd like to discuss. Um, but it's about if coffee is a place where people come and sit and talk and share ideas, <coughs> it's also a space where women are kind of non-confrontational about the way that they educate. And also they have a commitment to community's interests. Um, these are the three women that were working at the site that I showed previously with the trash workers. Um, coffee is supposed to generate income for them. That's why, that, that's the last reason that coffee is here. They have to pay for all of the inputs, but they get to keep all of the profit. There are a lot of disparities among sites. Like I said, there's 107. A lot of um, 
these women in particular are suffering. Um, several, I believe three out of the 10 members, no, I'm sorry, four out of the 10 members originally that joined the cooperative are now not working. Um, it is two shifts of three. And it is because even though it was supposed to be an income generating opportunity for these uh, men and women, they don't really see any income. Other people, however, d they do share stories and there's a little bit resentment um, among sites because you're given the site, you do not get to choose. And the ones that have more movement are making a lot of money. Um, they're able to open uh, uh, little shops, uh, sell food, drink, even printers. They have printers where they can uh, make copies, sell it with goods. Um, and finally, once again, even within the federal narrative, you have these mobile public toilets are a pilot project of best practice. Because it is successful, it will be scaled up. There's a plan to implement this throughout the country. They don't just have toilets, they have coffee, you know. So coffee's still central, but <coughs> even then, this project, which was implemented in January, even though it may not necessarily be successful in practice, um, it was decided upon implementation that it was going to be an example of best practice. Um, and that is a coffee tree next to a toilet. <laughs> in the forest. In, in the forest where I do other work. Yeah. So thank you. OK, so those of you who are sitting in the back, do you want to come closer? Or that's kind of why we had made a circle in the area, so we could have some. If you want to hide in the back, that's fine, as long as you speak up. <laughs> okay, any back? questions? Of course. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was a mess, sorry. Yeah. No, it's really good. It's a really <coughs> interesting presentation. And I got to go and visit some of these places. So I, but I think parts that I wonder about are how these women are, are they selected? Like how do they become, how do they join these cooperatives? Are they like told that you have to just do this or do they like, I don't know, like how does that process work? Okay, um, that's a really great question and something that is still kind of messy. Um, these women are, so within your district, you are put on a list if you are on so the unemployment list, because this was targeting unemployment or unemployed people, the Wereda would go through the list and pick out people and go and say, would you like to be involved in this project? Some people chose not to be involved in the project because if they remain on the unemployed list and there is another government development project, they would then maybe have that opportunity. Um, other people who were asked decided to join. Now, with that, if you are on that list, how they decide who to go to first, um, I'm not quite sure. I have been told that a lot of it has to do because it is uh, district government, that it depends on how active you are and how if they know your face. Um, and I do, yeah, I, I've so had this one. Do you have to be like a party member too, or do you have to be? You don't have to. When they joined the project, they were all asked to be a party member. And then since then, they have been asked repeatedly to be a party member. But the people that were, that I did spend time with talking, over the course of the summer, I learned that they had attended certain, let's say, um, workshops on sanitation or um, gone a lot and said, I really want an opportunity. This is what I've contributed to the community thus far. Um, so I believe that there's a hierarchy, but it's an informal one. And that's, I would really like to focus more on the one at that level. I was not able to do that, and I hope to do that when I go back in December, is target that government structure. Yeah. And these women are in charge of maintaining the public bathrooms yes. and the coffee? Yes. 
And is the coffee a mandatory thing? Yes. They're like, we're going to put a cafe next to a toilet. Yes. It is, it is That's a, a part of the whole, okay. The, the model is you have a coffee ceremony that is mandatory, but you have to pay for it all. And it's supposed to be income generating. Then you have the toilets, which for the first year, the Addis Ababa Water and Sewerage Agency will provide you with free clean water. And so it's also a place where people in the community can come and get clean water. Um, you have the public toilets that the men and women are supposed to manage. The men were added to the project in order to help with that specifically, because they see it as more manual labor and also carrying a lot of the um, uh, like the inputs for the coffee going to market, bringing it back. The men are supposed to do that. It hasn't really worked out that way. Um, and then they're also supposed to have flowers and planters and trees and stuff like that, and to be an urban park. So these employees pay for everything? No. Coffee related? Yes, everything coffee related. But they have to do it. They have to do it. And then at the end of this year, they will also have to start paying rent on the cement block in which the coffee ceremony is placed. To who? To who? Um, the agent. To the what? To the lawyer. To the district. And on top of that, there's a shop. Each place has a souk. It's just a small cubicle. And um, it's meant to also be an income generating activity. It's not mandatory though. You can do whatever you want with it. It's supposed to be a place where you can sell, um, wow, uh, all I can think of is soft. Yeah. Yeah. Toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Toilet paper. Soft tissue. Soft tissue, sorry. <laughs> you gotcha. Soft. Toilet paper, um, soap, and soda, stuff like that. <laughs> Are these coffee ceremonies, is that a thing? Is it, is that a, um, when you mean coffee ceremony, do you just mean somebody selling coffee? Is that what you mean by coffee ceremony? No, not you at You mean all. an actual like thing? Yes, I mean it's not, and that's also something that I want to explore is can I really say ritual? Can I really say ceremony? Are they the same thing? Um, maybe ritual is better because ceremony, I'm not quite sure because it can be reshaped. I, I'm not quite sure, but no, it's not just like you go and you have the coffee ready made. It's you have to sit there and they boil the coffee. Sometimes they roast the coffee and grind the coffee if they don't have it ready. Um, but I mean like me going to Starbucks, is no. that a ceremony or a ritual? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but is this Perhaps. another thing? <laughs> you know, if this I got to pour different. over coffee at, 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 at um, Volta, is that what you mean by coffee ceremony? It's a way in which they prepare coffee. I would not say that that is how I would define it. It's a tradition. Yeah, is it, more it like is. Tea ceremony in Japanese? Yes, yes, a lot of times Very that's how so. they, yeah, they relate to that. Can so you talked about the- I bet I can talk no, about that. No, I mean, can we say that a coffee ceremony? I don't think so that a coffee ceremony. <laughs> as far as I know, most people are working on such kind of coffee. They roast the coffee usually at their own home. Sometimes they pound it and then they crash it at home and they boil it and they sell it. If you say a coffee ceremony, I think it has, you know, even sometimes it has three, three stages. And if right. you say a coffee ceremony, they should have that three stages. And at the same time, they have to serve also some kinds of food. You know, usually when people serve coffee, they provide either a kind of bread or cop, um, cop corn. See, they have ambasha. They have bread. Okay. Some have popcorn, some have cola. Uh -huh. um, and they do not roast at home and they do not grind at home. They do that all on site. Even though it's made, you know, they smell it as part of it. Yes, drug. the wafting, which is also, yeah. They do that all there. It may not be as timely, and you do not have to, it's not going to be that tradition of drinking three cups over the hour and a half. But it is still very much an Ethiopian tradition. But no. Yeah, it's a kind it's, of, yeah. It's, it's shifted, it's shifted yeah. and that's part of the, this yeah, project. Like, it's like, like a pre-packaged, shorter version for the, for the bathroom. Well, yeah. it's, it's a long-standing tradition. Like, nobody knows the origin of it, really. But it's, you can't drink coffee without going through some kind of ceremony if you're socializing. Mm -hmm. By yourself, family, that's different. If you're socializing, then it becomes very important. 
But nowadays, you, you don't have to sit through it. You go in any time into restaurants, they're always having this constant ceremony mm -hmm. taking place, in which you can then just order the coffee, uh, yet the ceremony is taking place. So it, it solves that traditional ritual aspect, but at the same time, it's commercially viable, mm -hmm. right? Because you just go in and buy, get the coffee anytime you want, but the ceremony is ongoing. But the question I had is, why is it why is it necessary to charge for the toilet? As the example you gave about the taxi cab drivers, who didn't want to pay the three and a half cents, which by the way you probably don't know what one. Oh bar, yeah. What one bar is? That's about three cents more or less. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, why why is the government making people pay for? The <coughs> well, okay, so the one bar is then. So remember. One bird, 20, whether it's 20 or 50%, goes back to Addis Ababa Water and Sewerage Agency. So let's say it's half. Half of that is supposed to be reinvested in the project. So really just upkeeping infrastructure. The other 50% is supposed to be income generating. And eventually that will be used to pay for the water. Because right now they're giving free water access. But if you're concerned about hygiene, I mean, this is obviously. I know. Uh, the, the rat, you know, the, the, what do you want to call it, Debbie, the, the, the way that people think, the government thinks about these sort of things, uh, is very hard to overcome. Uh, and you would say, why are they having to pay for the, for the toilets? Why doesn't the government just pay the thousand dollars a year, maybe? <laughs> well, so I think, I mean, I think but just having read, yes. having read that, I think this is part of a global, you know, it's, it's a trend that it reflects, you know, this neoliberal influence, very strong influence in global policies, and we see exactly the same, you know, described in this paper. So I think it's just, yeah. Probably I not give something for nothing. Who says, who says those taxi drivers would <coughs> use the, the public toilet if it was free? That's unknown. I, they may not want to go at the toilet. That's I mean, their, it's not. That's their excuse. Yeah. I mean, for it's guys, not, it's much so easier to go on the right. side of the truck, as you said. No, so. right. Question. The same. I know they want to use the excuse, at least they wouldn't have that excuse. To <laughs> and of course, it's also the hygiene. Uh, so I have a question about the coffee. Like when you brought this picture up, it kind of reminded me of a lot of the households I went to in Uganda where they do grow their own coffee and then often, like, sun, like, dry it and sell it and I'm wondering like prior to the coffee ceremonies is there like a connection between the um, public toilets and like the production of the coffee or is that completely separated like are are people um, connected to like the farmer coffee farmers or no no so there's no like mass connection there's like not a group that they buy from or anything no the interesting thing about Ethiopian coffee production is that 50% of what is grown in country does stay in country. Um, but within the city, and especially within this project, there isn't that direct link between who's growing the coffee and who's not. Um, or, I'm sorry, who's growing the coffee and who's consuming the coffee and where they're getting the coffee from. And within that trade system, <coughs> you can't really trace it back to a specific community either. Okay. Yeah, because all of that that you can trace is exported. Um, so, because I don't know much about the, the tradition of the coffee ceremony, but I wanted to go back to the point that you made that where somebody brought up that the coffee is um, clean. So, the role of the ritual, and what is, what's the role of that, the coffee ceremony in social religion? Like, what does it do as part of that? In religion. In a, well, yeah, I, re, I was just, I'm trying oh, to. That's one other issue. Like, no, uh, she said in social relations. In social oh, relations. relations. Not social no, relations. No, relations. No, relations. no, social <coughs> relationship. I'm just trying to understand, like, what it is that, how it plays into the social relationships that might link up with the discussion of cleanliness. It's interesting because the coffee ritual is a domestic ritual that has been shifted to the public sphere, and I think it's within that shift in which they're making this cleanliness okay, kind so of link. Not that sitting down to the ritual is 
does anything in terms of relationships between individuals who may not be getting along, and it's, it's a sort of a new, like a tabula rasa yeah. sort of a thing. If you go through mm -hmm. a this this tradition, then it helps clean your relationship. That's something to really explore. I have not other way. Yeah. That sounds, I've never heard about that. I haven't read anything about I don't, that. Yeah, and I don't know anything about it. Yeah. I think it's <laughs> important to, to, and that's what, I mean, you're probably going to be focusing on one area of paper, is, is that, you know, these, the domestic coffee ceremonies has been described and is very often, you know, as a, a, solidari a, a space for women's solidarity. So it's it's a very it's a social space for recreation, both you know within the family, but also in terms of the very closest neighbors. Okay, so it's this it has this very important recreational and also religious function, which you really haven't really talked about, uh, especially for some. It also differs in Ethiopia among different groups how coffee is seen for some for example like Protestant Christians they may think that this is you know this is something negative there are you know religious elements that they won't really approve of so then some would take a uh, kind of distance but I think Sorry, you say Protestant Christians uh, see the coffee ceremony as something negative? Yeah both yeah. Protestant and also I think there's one article also among uh, Jew, uh, Ethiopian Jews for example it's it's it's, it's it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is this is, and even for for, um, I have a friend who's studying uh, holy water in Addis Ababa, and she says she's saying that at these holy water places, there's a lot of you know the jebanas, the the coffee um, yeah. mugs that people have left because that is kind of uh, you know uh, before and after kind of. A way of getting rid of the old, it could be you know gins or other things. That's so. So it, it has this amongst for some it has this kind of you know I don't know how to explain it, but it's it ha it's kind it's of contested. Uh, but then among a, a lot of other groups like the Roma, it's highly sacred. It's yeah, really it's, sacred. I was going to say that if there's anything. Sorry, I mean, anything that that unites. <laughs> and one of the things that unites the different ethnic groups is the coffee ceremony. It basically cross cuts most, most, if not all, ethnic groups in Ethiopia, one way or another. And uh, what you're saying is a bit disturbing to say that that's actually falling yeah, apart as well. But then, what I was going to say in terms of the, 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 the shift so it has been kind of a recreation of space for women and for building close relationships, but then by, I think, shifting it to the this, the, the, the public sphere, it becomes a, the, a place where women serve mainly men, because very few women will sit down and, and have a coffee or even use the public toilets. Even to be seen using the public toilets is very uh, problematic you know, for women. So that's a very interesting shift <laughs> that's happening. Yeah, um, I try to stay away from that because I was trying to focus on differentiating these yeah. two articles, but they keep coming I think the question will be to differentiate coffee ceremony from ritual. Mm -hmm. In the area that I came from, for example, when we go to in the northern, in the northern western part of Ethiopia, especially in Amhara region, there is a coffee ceremony that is not considered as a ritual. When we say ritual, people thought that they, this coffee connects with something, maybe with a certain kind of things, but in the area I came, they are not considered as a kind of ritual. They know they believe in ceremony, mm -hmm. especially they believe that coffee gives them a kind of socialization yeah. for socializing themselves. Whether they drink or not, when neighbors offer them to drink coffee, they went there, they sit there, they talk and they socialize themselves. I mean, it may be in political, social, or other activities, but they did not consider us really a ritual, maybe in Oromia, there may be. So you have to identify these things, especially, in or, yeah. especially when you go to in, in uh, uh, Orthodox Christian, they condemn that even drink coffee, not good. I mean, they consider us a kind of something bad because they told that if people consider us a ritual practice, 
it goes to against Orthodox, that's why they are not advising to consider just like as a ritual practice. So it's a kind of socializing practice more than ritual. In, but it depends on how you define ritual. The ritual can be, you know, many different things. Uh, rites of intensification is one example of ritual traditionally. So it, socializing is a form of intensification of, 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 of uh, relationships. So it depends on how you want to define ritual. Interesting, because I wouldn't have thought of it differently. I would call it a ritual. Maybe it should be a ritual. And I would call Do you think of a really religious implications? Yeah, religious has an impact. I yeah. know that my grandparents, my, both of my grandparents, they were drinking coffee when I was a kid. Finally, the priest said that no coffee is not good. People came together, they tried to talk about somebody. So you have to abandon, I mean, you have to stop to drink coffee. If you want to drink coffee, don't talk about bad things against other people. They said that when people gather together, for example, they start to say, okay, Mr. X did this, Mr. Y did this. So if you are drinking coffee, you have to stop to do such kind of things. So can I ask tie to that then? This seems really rather interesting in this context because it seems like coffee and the activities that surround it are a form of social control. And so there's, a, you know, you stop doing it so that you don't, um, you know, talk about other people and that sort of thing. So in this case, you know, they try and pull people in with coffee and make them use these bathrooms. So it's um, for me usurping. Yeah, it, well, it's totally oh, yeah. Which is, I mean, because it's, it's, disturbing. <laughs> so. it, it's an interesting thing for them to have connected together because it seems like there's so many layers to this that it's, you know, obviously problematic. But can I ask one question about the, the usurping is actually what I was thinking of is oftentimes when um, things get moved out of a domestic sphere into public sphere, and especially when they're uh, monetized, men often come into the picture. And so you already mentioned that they're actively trying to get men into these projects, but is it by um, with the water and things like that? I think if I understood what you were saying, actively not, trying to get men. Yeah, involved in cleaning the toilets and. Oh yes, yeah, so that would be out of the ten people in the cooperative, about three of them. Okay, yeah. and, but they're not, are they involved, they're not involved in selling the coffee. That's, they never make the coffee. They never they make the serve. coffee. They'll food. serve. They'll okay. serve. Yeah, okay. Well, food. They'll serve the snacks, mm -hmm. and they'll serve the drinks, but they will never perform the coffee ceremony. Okay. What about the <coughs> collection of money associated with that ceremony, though? So they, they, they don't do the making of the coffee, but you said there's shops there, there's... Um, do they, are they? So they take <laughs> shifts. They, uh -huh. Not all 10 work at the same time. Right. And so they log what is made on specific days. Mm -hmm. They all share a bank account. Okay. Um, and so that is, so for instance, interesting too. Yeah. <laughs> that one's interesting because you were talking about the unemployed and how um, people are selected. So in the case of that are no longer part of that project or no longer work on site, they are still officially working based on that list. And the reason why they want to stay on it is because if for some reason their site collapses or at the time when they decide not to renew their lease, they receive a cut of profits at the end. But has that in hand. Yeah. <laughs> So going back to like the ritual versus ceremony discussion, um, I was thinking of this whole issue with the coffee um, like stands and then also the <laughs> toilets and how the coffee uh, ceremony seems to be social, like inherently, but then the toilets and the hygienic aspect isn't social, but they're kind of trying to connect the two. And I wonder if ritual is maybe a better term because like the hygienic ritual is taking place and like a coffee ritual is taking place as opposed to like th there needs to be some connection there, I think. But how do you define ritual? <laughs> like, I guess that would be the, the difficulty. <laughs> but for me, I think in this situation, it's it goes back to some practice that has like different parts that have purpose in a social, 
context, a cultural context. So I guess I'm maybe going with the most basic <laughs> explanation, but I'm kind of thinking of the, like it's the intro to cultural yeah, anthropology yes. reading, the Nasarima <laughs> type thing, and like. The two major divisions of passages and expectations. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's like my question is like, what, what words, what lexical repertoire you're going to use to connect those two different things because it seems like the government isn't, but I, I feel like there needs to be some cultural are. connection. Aren't they already connected though? That's like the model, you have to have both. So you could also refer to how they're talking, the language that the model is using to, to connect them. Yeah, but I feel like there's still some level of disconnect with it. She, you brought up habits. We keep yes. talking about this in terms of rituals and ceremonies. But when you initially started, you were talking about this as a habit, trying to get people to associate habits together. Mm -hmm. And so it was not associating the, the it was having the coffee and the toilet in one place as a people are going to go here and they're going to then associate going to the bathroom in a, in a toilet, you know, with something people do frequently, I think. Yeah. So and that was sort of the connection I thought. But is that something that they're doing? Is that coming from them from the inception of the project? Was that um, something to bring people to these public toilets? Or is that something we're stretching, we're imposing on, on, on these ideas, no, on that's, our own ideas? That's kind of why I opened with um, like coffee is life and coffee, it's a rest area. People, I mean, I have quotes in which they're saying coffee is there to bring people in because coffee is a daily ritual. And in, when you look at that World Bank report, they use the word ritualize. Mm -hmm. And it's and to me, that's the connection there is ritualizing something, making it a habit. Right. Yeah. And yes. so, and, and that's, I think, what they're trying to do. There's this coffee ritual. And uh, to me, there I just have a ritual the, yeah, 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 very different way than you are. But you are yeah. talking about right. the ritual. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And yes. To the extent when you go to the area in Amhara, wow. I know that, for example, when they were offering this bread or sandisha or kolo and all this popcorn, at the beginning <laughs> they called it yebunnakos, breakfast for coffee. And finally they said that, why you call it yebunnakos or breakfast for coffee? This is a ritual system. You have to say just a kind of food. You have to say bread, you have to say popcorn, and just like, don't say kolo yebunnakos. Even they say to the extent that. So you have to be careful. And at the same time, have you seen any difference? I mean, when you go to Nadis, there are a lot of many places that people sell coffee in every street. There are many. So have you seen to make some kinds of relation between the new kind of model with that one? And my other question is that can you say this is really for a place of socializing because when you look at these places, they are very small, they are very small limited space. People usually sit and drink one cup of coffee and leave soon. Even sometimes when I went to such kind of places, there are people who are still standing and waiting for somebody who was gone. So can you say that these places are useful for socializing really? You use the toilet? I mean, I mean, this place is peop when we say socializing, people sit together, take some time to talk some certain issues. But when you look at these places, they, are very, they have very limited space. So, and usually people are drinking one cup or two cups of coffee and soon, li soon they left for and other also people. In front of toilets. We're forgetting that there are bathrooms. But there and is some socializing. socializing. I feel like there is some socializing. And it's very interesting mm -hmm. because I've done some work in terms of the third place coffee shops here in the U.S. And when you look at these sites, there's 107 of them, and they really reflect the communities that are there, and they're built for those communities, they're managed by those communities, and the people that come are the community members. And so they already have these social relations, and they will sit, and they will talk. And I feel like there is this socializing element to it. I don't see everyone using the toilets but it's more as a social space. Um, maybe in terms of transit, remember it is a rest area, so I feel like the model is also considering the movement and the places which 
situated, um, but I think they are creating social spaces. And in terms of your previous question of a difference between, are, are you asking about the difference between the coffee ceremony at this place? Yeah, I agree. The coffee suspicions are coffee that I don't know, so. Right. So, yeah. yeah. There's not a large difference, I would say, between what's happening in this development project versus what may be happening right next door. I, I heard you asking, are people really sitting down and drinking coffee at these at these places together rather than just, I'll, I'll take one cup, no, they drink do. it, go to the bathroom and leave? They meet there. I've, I've witnessed an interview. Someone was getting interviewed for a job. Yeah. Um, I just had a quick question. If you could shed more light on the selection process of where they place these toys. Because you were mentioning how um, they might not be sort of scattered in such a way that it's equal, that potentially are ethnic groups being favored in terms of living in the city? So I would really like to overlay this with uh, political mm. mm -hmm. um, and really see, because you can see that there are quite a few places that aren't receiving any toilets. Granted, there are only 107 implemented thus far. They have plans for over 600. They're way behind schedule. <laughs> they were supposed to have them all done by now. Um, they are chosen for a very small area. They're called mobile because they are easily disassembled. And right now, they're on plots of land, very small plots of land, that the Land Bureau does not have to approve. Because if the city wanted to expand, they could just disassemble it and move it somewhere else. You cannot come and pick it up, though. I mean, it's it's actually built, um, but it's just easily disassembled. They're chosen as places of high population density, um, places where there's a lot of movement, so transit. Um, I went and I visited 72 out of the 107, and there were a lot placed in front of health facilities. I think also this kind connection with clean, sanitation, hygiene, education, um, churches and mosques, and places traditionally used as open defecation, um, so mapping. Who owns the land? The state. So the government owns all Everything. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about your comment about, you know, this is where the health centers are and everything else. It's also, um, if one, it wouldn't be too hard to actually overlay what you're talking about want to do that we should talk because I can help um, but also these are spaces that are people are coming to in the first place which is why these spaces are there and so it may not be a link to cleanliness it may simply be this is the center of that community of where people go for the mosque and the church and health and I don't think that's that's a, it, it, well I'm sure it's not that that's simple not. but that's probably one component of why you're finding that in those same places because the infrastructure is there that they're, you know, it's, I mean, it seems like, especially down south, that that's just going along the road. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. And those health Makes centers sense. are probably along that road too, but there's also wealth differentials mm -hmm. in terms of who would be able to pay for toilets, who would be able to work at these toilets, even if they're unemployed and get to them. Um, so yeah, it would be really interesting to overlay it. There's a bunch of stuff you can do. So, thank you. And then, I came in late, so I didn't hear the very beginning of what you were saying, but do you see this project as being applied or theoretical? And if it's, well, let me, you answer that question first. Wait, what pro, my project? Your, yeah, your, and your, what's your, is your goal oh, more of an applied one? No. more to understand this from a theoretical? Theoretical. Okay. Yeah. Why does it have to be one or the other? As of now, theoretical. Why? Yes. You want me to really answer it correctly? Yes. Because, uh, <laughs> because uh, I think you, you can't tell one without the other. Uh, because the, the, the Ethiopian government probably won't uh, listen to what she has uh, to say anyway, in terms of her case. Okay. Or they, so they will context. listen, but not implement. Okay. Right. Given just from experience over many years. And it doesn't have anything to do with it being the Ethiopian government. Once something has been established as a model, whether it's by <laughs> Ethiopian government or anybody else, it is a model, and it's kind of, nobody wants to hear a different story. 
and, and that's the same whether you're in Ethiopia or where you're in yeah. other, other places, I think. So. And if the government really wanted to do something about IGE, you know, they could, frankly, they should put all their the ones over where bus stops are, minibus places, or lined up waiting for many, many minutes to get on. But that's and one of the places that's where they are, are yeah. very often. That's where they are. Yes. Yeah. A are lot of them. Yeah, I'll show you. Yeah. Well, you just, you I said there were health centers these. and this and that. And, no, but places of transit. So I mean, people are moving. You said, but not places where they're waiting in line. Yeah. Long periods of time. Well, she means like taxi parks. Yeah. Yeah. Because she was showing the picture earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, no, no, yeah. it's yeah. it's fine. And the interesting thing too is that uh, narrative about Coffee's life working with, or when I was talking to the person that's kind of in charge of this project, um, is before I oh I asked him who was funding the project, because it's still a big question. And there's this question of ownership, and they consider it their project, and they consider the women and the men who manage it their site. Who and there's they? Um, the, the government. Okay. So yeah, the project, the government, <coughs> has these claims of ownership over the different levels. Okay. And um, I asked, though, because there has been Everyone I talk to kind of says, oh, some foreign entity is funding this. And um, when I read that World Bank report, I thought, oh, man, it has to be the World Bank. And then I saw um, in the Addis Fortune, the newspaper, there was one um, article that said the World Bank was working with the government to implement toilets. When I asked this government official, he said, no, it is our project. This is what we are doing for the city which I think is very interesting and important in this political context right now, mm. is that they are doing it for the city. But he, within five minutes, said, I'm sorry, I need to run. I have a meeting with the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but so, yeah, it's their project, but who is funding it? That's exactly. That's, that's, I that's, really that's, think. and But that also feeds into this model, because as you know, what the article talks about is there are a lot of these themes, and it could be a global model that is just reshaped for Ethiopia. So we had a lot of questions, but we didn't really have time to uh, discuss the paper. 